Robin Harris is going to be her chauffeur and take her home tomorrow. But he, she was also going to pick her up if the weather was bad, so we had to do a little driving for that. But I'll tell you just a little bit about Dee Dee. She has five children, three of whom fly. Uh, she has one daughter, Robin, who flies. And she has a son, Dean, who's with American Airlines, and another son, Marshall, who's with the uh, Air Force Reserve. And when the Wasps in 1992 had a reunion in San Antonio, he was there, and he offered to fly all of us in a C-5. Now, a C-5 is, at that time, was the largest aircraft in the Air Force. So, son flew the largest one in the Air Force, and mother flew the largest one in World War II. And when we got in the airplane, we seated her behind the pilot and co-pilot, and as they were coming in for a landing, the crew said, now you better make this a good one because your mother is watching. <laughs> uh, I was asked to explain about the uniform. This is an authentic uniform. Mine happens to be on display in the Smithsonian. And when I was the president of the WASP organization, when we were attempting to get our recognition as veterans, which we did, uh, one of the women could not come to the uh, hearings that we had because she was quite ill. But she said, I'm, I'm going to send you my uniform, and I'd like you to wear it and always think of it. Her name was Gretchen Greta. So she did die, but uh, this is her uniform, and it is for real. So uh, I would now like to introduce my good friend and fellow wasp, Dee Dee Mormon. She told me to give the high sign if she's talking too long. <laughs> yes, I am very, very nervous and I'm trying to simmer down. But anytime you don't want to hear me anymore, just go like that and I'll quit. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm going to be very brief until we get to the nitty gritty. But I learned to fly in North Platte, Nebraska in the CPT. I was very fortunate to be one female who got to fly in that class. Um, and, uh, and I okay. Will that be better? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Then later I worked for the uh, flying service and uh, then applied for the WASP. When I read about this, that they were actually going to let women fly, and they were going to fly military aircraft, and I sent in my application and, and, and actually got in. I was very excited. I went to Sweetwater, and, cla and the class was 43, 3, 4, and uh, I was in the first class at Sweetwater because they were doing their training in Houston also. And it was co-educational because they had some leftover cadets that were still finishing it up. So we did have a co-educational group that was interesting. Graduated in August and, and uh, they first everybody went into the uh, trans Air Transport Command. The class before me, they started sending a few 25 women to tow target as an experiment. And it worked out well, so in my class, they sent another 25 to tow target. And I got, was in that, chosen to be in that group. So we all went to Camp Davis, North Carolina. Uh, it was fascinating. Fascinating because in tow target, you got to fly all the old aircraft that they brought back from combat. And it was a very challenging group. It also, you flew a lot of different kinds. You'd start out in the morning maybe with an L4 or 5. Then in the afternoon, while well, you might 
toe in the A24 or 25. End of the night, you could have a uh, searchlight mission. So it was very interesting. From there, I went to... Uh, well, while I was there, I, met, I had met the man I was going to marry, and I, when I married him, we came back after Christmas leave, and I was on the list to go. The commanding officer was extremely unhappy that I had dared to marry his son of his pilots. So he shipped me off to uh, Georgia. And it was interesting. Anyway, in Georgia, we learned radio control. This was very fascinating. This was in the olden days when it, it was done very differently than today's radio control, which is wonderful. But we had a group of five who were a team, and you flew three at a time. You had one flying the UC-78, and seating in, seated in the co-pilot section was the beat pilot. She was, she had a, a all of these little toggles. You, you had to have a toggle for each separate movement. The target was the PQ-8. The PQ-8 was a very racy, tri tricycle geared aircraft. And uh, people at, at Camp Davis had loved to take them out. They had to put so many hours on them before they could use them as a target. And uh, everybody liked to fly it because it, it was a fun, fun aircraft. So you had one of you who flew in that. Next, in your right-hand side, you had a great big machine that we called George. If the beat pilot was going to make you spin, crash, or burn, well, then you reached over and undid George, and then you could handle the flying. Well, this was all very interesting, and then we were, we were in a group of five who were sent to uh, Otis Field in Massachusetts. And uh, from there we went down to Eglin Field. And at Eglin Field I was in a thing called Special Projects. And we were still doing the uh, radio control. Three of them, uh, three of my friends went to the outer fields and did a lot of transporting of of uh, ships that needed to go in for repair and this kind of thing. We had not been there too long when I was in the day room one day and uh, this colonel came in so I got up to leave because I thought he was a friend of, of one of the nurses who was there. We lived in the nurses' quarters there. And he said, well if you're a wasp I want to talk to you. And he introduced himself his name was Colonel Paul Tibbetts, and he said, uh, I, have, I have a job I'd like to have two WASP pilots for, and he said, I'd like to, I've uh, checked this, and, and uh, I know that you don't have any four-engine time. Now, he said, do we all not have four-engine time? I said, that's right, we fly, we have twin-engine, but no four-engine among the five of us. And we chatted a little while, and I thought, well, this is fascinating. He said, well, I have this mission that you, I want to teach you. And he said, what I'm doing, I'm in charge of the B-29 program, and I'm having a little problem because there are some fires in this, and uh, for some reason, some of my pilots have decided that it's a dangerous aircraft. He said, it is not a dangerous aircraft. It is the finest thing the Air Force has. And he said, what we want to do is find two WASP who have no four-engine time and check them out in an eight-hour training session and send them on a tour of the bases. Well, here I am. Four engines, the biggest thing in the inventory. He said, we feel that if two women show up at these bases, the men will be too shamed to not fly. <laughs> so 
somebody said to me once, well, what they're saying is, if a woman can do it, anyone can do it. I said, they can say whatever they want to me. They can call me anything. If they're going to let me fly their biggest aircraft, I don't care. <laughs> and that, this was great because the, uh, he said, and where are the other three? He said, I know where, where Fenton is. And he said, that, I said, well, the others are out on the, on the outline. I don't know which one of the, of the uh, satellite bases they're out at, but I do know that Dora is checking out in the A-20 today. He said, I'll take her. So he said, you and Dora, be at the, at the uh, um, airport tomorrow. And he said, I'll call you. Well, I couldn't wait for Dora to come in. And they came in, and, and they called me to say that they were at the club eating. I went tearing down. I said, you're not going to believe this. I still don't believe it. Can, can you guess what they're going to let us do? And they couldn't believe it either. So we, we decided that we would go ahead and pack just on a chance that it wasn't a practical joke. And Dora would go out uh, to the outlying fields, whichever one they were at, and then I would call her if it turned out to be true. Well, it turned out to be true. And I called her, and, they, and they, she flew back in, and, and we went off to uh, uh, Birmingham, thank you, Birmingham, Alabama, which was where they had this B-29 that they assigned to us. And when we got up there, of course, the people who were chosen for this particular assignment, the personnel, had been very carefully chosen by Colonel Tibbetts. They were his, some of his very best people, his very, his um, crew chief, his flight engineer, all of these people were the best. They were, they were not going to send us off in this aircraft without all the support that we needed. But they were, it, it was a fascinating experience. We had so much humor. Lots of funny things happened while we were there. We started out and it was hot. And I don't think many of you have seen what was the WASP flight suit. It was a very interesting blue coverall type with a drop seat. <laughs> and it was, it was a, a real dog. But hey, it was also very hot. And Anniston, we flew out of Anniston, which is next door to Birmingham. And uh, it, it was a, a hot time. We flew in the, in the morning, in the afternoon, and then at night, We'd go back to the hotel in Birmingham, and Colonel Tibbetts would usually take us, and we would study the uh, take orders, and uh, he said, you're going to get eight hours, and then you're going to be ready to fly this. We're going to make a tour of the B-29 bases. And, uh, of course, we're still not really sure it's going to happen. It just, it's got to be some reason that it won't, they'll quit. But the, these men that we flew with, they had uh, two complete crews of enlisted, and they had three, I believe there were four of his pilots who were B-29 pilots. One of them was the one who dropped the second atomic bomb in later years, but they were very, very helpful, and they wanted this to work. So they were very happy to spend all this time with us and teach us. It was, uh, we went over to Anniston every morning, flew over there, and uh, we flew, either I would fly co-pilot and Dora first pilot, or vice versa, and uh, the colonel would sit on the jump seat in between and watch us. And uh, the, uh, of course, their flight engineer could have flown the thing by himself. He was one of those. He was just fabulous. He was also a man with a mind of his own, and they told him they were going to put his stripes on with snaps because he kept, they kept taking them off of him. 
But boy, he knew that airplane. He did. And he had, that's what, that was his job. But we went over one day, and uh, we had a, a fire, and came running, bumping out of there and turning everything off as we went. And then we had to fly back to uh, the other field. This was in the satellite field with uh, the Army in a B, B-24. And it was being flown by a civilian test pilot. And, and to us, it was such a funny looking. He was red haired. He had on a t-shirt. He had on shorts and tennis shoes. <laughs> and and, and all, everybody in our crew just looks at him. But we made it back uh, to Anniston. And uh, then another time, we were coming off, coming back from a trip, came in asking for uh, entry into the pattern. And I think I was handling the, the voice, and Dora was doing the flying, and uh, called and, and called the tower and said that uh, this is Army number so and so, and we are on. Um, turning into the pattern, want your permission. And they came screaming back, hold, I mean, so-and-so, hold your conversation. We have a B-29 in the pattern with no, no communication. So we called in again. They gave us the same routine. And then I called and I said, this is the B-29. <laughs> there is absolutely no conversation. They said, clear to land. <laughs> they came out of the tower. We could see this. They came out of the tower, and they're all standing there where they could see the runway. And they, of course, all of this conversation is easily heard. They had a B-24 on the flight line. The next thing we see is their entire crew on the wings. We came in to land and Colonel Tibbetts said, if you bounce this, you're dead. <laughs> oh, it, it was just so funny because everything, oh no, no pressure. <laughs> you could go home. <laughs> but it, it was, it was a, a fascinating absolutely fascinating insurance uh, occurrence. We uh, had studied hard. We were there, I think, 10 days, I think is what I said. Three? Doris says three? Oh, we were longer than that. <laughs> See, we have it here, but it's an operational problem. <laughs> anyway, when we got ready to go on this tour, Probably the, to us, to Dora and I, the nicest compliment that was paid to us was the fact that we had two complete crews, all the people on the interior of the aircraft, not, not the pilots. And uh, the colonel called them all together and he said, now we're going back to Eglin and then we're going to leave from there. We're going to make a tour in the bases. Now, Didi and Dora are going to be flying this. They are going to handle all of the radio work, they're going to do all of the all of the flight plans. This is a volunteer. I'm not ordering any of you to do do this with us. It is purely your choice. And all but one wanted to go on this trip with us. His wife was having a baby and he said he'd rather stay home. But so they they all came and we started out went up to Birmingham, picked up, oh, the aircraft that they had us flying in, they had painted a big Fifi on it. And it was called the Ladybird. And of course, this was one of the first things we'd seen when we got up to Anniston. We were so thrilled. Of course, it also really put, put the weight on us because it had to be done right. There was no room for making any mistakes. So we got ready and started, and I flew the first leg into Tinker Tower, Oklahoma. And uh, we came in, 
and uh, we got out and walked in to, to close our flight plan and uh, get changed so the door would fly the next leg. And this young lieutenant came up to me and he said, did you come in on that aircraft? And I said, yes. He said, were you flying it? Yes. You don't have the strength. I said, Lieutenant, they build trim tabs. <laughs> it was funny. We went on from there out to Clovis, New Mexico, which was the first stop on our, the first B-29 training base that was on our itinerary. And we came into there, and of course, uh, the base personnel didn't know that this was going to be a, a different B-29 crew. They, uh, we came in, and uh, Dora and I went in, and the others following us, and, and uh, these, these pilots, because they wanted to see how this new U-29 worked, maybe, they, maybe it was a better aircraft, you know, this kind of thing. And uh, they talked to one of the, the uh, one of the men and said, "Well, where are the pilots?" They said, "Oh, those two women are the pilots." Oh, well, they had a uh, a group in base ops that wrote a um, a letter each day, telling them what was going on and how the aircraft was doing and how they were solving their problems and all of this. And at the end, they talked about and they were talked about us in glowing terms, very flattering. And both Dora and I are just very common-looking people. She said, "Boy, did you? We better print those up and, and make them in duplicate. Nobody will ever talk to us like that again." <laughs> and it was great, but they, of course, they had the needle out for all their pilots. And these women brought this aircraft in. So it was arranged that they would fly. They'd have a, a pilot sitting behind the co the pilot seat and a pilot behind the co-pilot and the flight engineer, all, all of the people who fly crew on that came in and they each sat right next to our crew. Our crew. And Dora Strother, she was Dora Dorothy then, and she's writing a book on, on the WASP experiences. And when Hank and I, my husband and I stopped to see her, she said, I want you to help me. I want to be sure I've got all this B-29 right. And of course, I'm laughing. I said, you're the one that keeps the diary, so yours is probably better. But, uh, now where am I? <laughs> there, there. So Dora said to me at that time, she said, you remember that morning that that first crew came to get on board? And I said, no. She said, they all wore their parachutes. <laughs> Nobody ever wore a parachute. But they did. By the second day when they weren't wearing their parachutes, they decided it was, it was going to work out. But it was, um, it was one of those well-kept secrets that somehow gets around. And uh, friends of ours, WASP, far away as in, in Mississippi and, and down in Florida, had heard that two of us were flying this B-29. Well, there was a man in Mississippi who was the, the not the senator, but the representative. And he heard about this. And he happened to be a member, a very important member, of the military affairs team. He calls this group all together and, and uh, tells them they've got some women flying this B-29. He was not a happy man. So he, he called the Pentagon and he said, get those women out of my airplane. Well, his, his group handled the, uh, the money. So the next thing we know is that General Ant out of uh, Colorado Springs called Colonel Tavins and said, please bring the two wasps and come up to Colorado. I, I need to talk to you. So we went up happily. 
And he called us in and he, he said, I want to explain this to you before you hear it. We are going to have to put a stop to this. You can't go on to another station. The, the Pentagon has said that there will be no more women flying the B-29. But I, he said, I want to tell you, I want to thank you because you accomplished the mission. Our men are back, they're flying it, and everything is working. So he said, you did the job that we asked you to do. And we do, we, we consider this a successful effort. Well, of course, we were very sad. So we went back to Clovis and checked out of everything. And, uh, the Colonel Timmons said, uh, he said, on the way, he said, are you in a big hurry to get back to Eglin? No, we were frankly not wanting to hurry any place because we were pretty disappointed because when they had canceled this, they said there will be no women ever flying the B-29 again. I think, I think probably a, a couple of people did when they had them on, on bases that were kind of away from the public eye. And, I imagine they all got some time. I would have. Anyway, we uh, we went. He said, I want to take you to Grand Island, Nebraska. There's a heavy bombardment wing there. And uh, the, the man in charge of the bombardment wing is General Frank A. Armstrong. And he and I worked together in the ETO. And he said, he's a fine man, a very fine pilot. And uh, I'd like to have you meet him. I'd like to have you two meet him. So we flew in there, and uh, Colonel Tibbetts conferred with the general, and we were in some quarters. And we went, went out to, his wife had invited us out to a barbecue. We went out with the barbecue, and, and uh, Dora came up, and she said, Dee General Armstrong wants to take us for a ride, and he's going to row us around the, the lake. Okay, this is kind of funny, but all right. And he started in chatting. He was showing us how pretty Grand Island was and all of this. And then he got down to asking questions about our flying experience and what the target was like and all of this. And then he said, um, do you ladies type? <laughs> no, yes, we type. Okay. And he went on with other things. And we went back, and it turned out that uh, Colonel Tibbetts had asked him, he said, you don't have any wasps stuff here at Grand Island? And he said, no, we don't have any. Well, he said, would you like to have two? Because there's no reason for these, be these girls to go back to, to Edlin and do the, what they were doing before. And the general said, you know, I think it would be a good idea, because he said, I have a woman who is my age. I have a man, a captain, who is my co-pilot. And I have a secretary. And if I had one of these wasps, she could do three jobs. <laughs> and so, and then and Paul said, well, what will you do with the other one? Oh, he said, we need somebody who is multi-rated and we will we will check them out on everything. We have a B-25 here. We have a B-17. We have, uh, oh, the old B-34, which we remembered fondly from Toe Target. And uh, he said, we, we are very busy. We can use two wasps. In fact, as it turned out, we did well. And they ordered three more later on. And so we were very pleased. But anyway, uh, the general went back, we went back to the barbecue, and, and uh, he had, of course, talked this all over with Colonel Tibbetts to get his ideas about these assignments. And uh, he, he talked to his wife, and he said, uh, I'll ask one of them to be my, uh, my aide and my co-pilot. She said, take the married one. <laughs> <laughs> so they had that all settled. I got to go with, with the... Uh, General and, and Dora got to fly with the wing, which worked out fine. We went back to uh, Edlin, packed our clothes, and came up to Grand Island, Nebraska. 
it was uh, it was great because uh, again this man was a wonderful pilot he had been in the ETO he had uh, he had Paul had flown in uh, uh, Africa he was a very admirable individual and he was the head of this B-29 group which of course I can't fly anymore but they did have a, a, a lot of other things and he had a B-17 that was his aircraft and these the heavy bombardment wing had a uh, an overseas group in Cuba and uh, one of Now, theoretically, WASP did not fly outside of the continental United States. But uh, I don't think anybody argues with the general. So when we had to go down there, I got to fly to Cuba. In the meantime, I'd been checked out in the B-17 and the B-25. And uh, we had a, got to fly different missions, too. One day, they needed somebody to take the B-25 up to uh, Colorado Springs. And the tech rep for that aircraft was in. And he came around and he said, I'd like to fly up there with you. He said, I've never flown with a woman. And I said, fine, if you want to ride. Well, I'd Anybody. Well, he got a big kick out of it. This, this was his aircraft, and then, of course, that B-25 was a very beautiful aircraft, too. But we did a lot of flying in and out of Cuba, and I went uh, several times, went to Cuba, and, of course, every time I went down there, I tried to see my husband, who was in North Carolina, and one time he came down he had to ride a bus and a train, and he got to no, got to Orlando, and he saw a bunch of us. He'd been stationed with them all at Camp Davis, and he came out and he said, "Mary, where's where's Dee Dee?" She said, "You look really fast, right up there to the south. That's a B-17 going to Cuba." <laughs> So there he was. Well, from from there, when we came back, we were not down very long. We came back into Orlando, and uh, the general was very nice. He said, Diddy, wouldn't you like to uh, ask Hank if he wanted to fly back with us? I said, he'd be delighted. So he took Hank, and, and he got to sit in the co-pilot seat. And since he was doing C-47s and C-46s, he thought that was pretty neat. And we uh, went up to, uh, what was the name of that field in, in New York? It was the old, no, not Roosevelt, but Roy Mitchell. Roy Thank you, Mitchell. <laughs> well, now let's not have everybody be old enough. Come on, watch that. <laughs> anyway, we pulled in to Mitchell and uh, put him around, and, and he said, do you, have, do you have hotel reservations? Oh, no. Well, he said, Cy, Cy Bartlett was his eight, two, or three, or whatever they called it. He said, see the door at the Didi and Hank at the place. So we went to the Astor Hotel, and of course we were laughing, because these are things we don't get to do. And uh, we stayed there, and then we headed back. Hank went on up to his station, and uh, we steaded back, headed back, and we had a, a light load because Colonel Bartlett had to stay. He had to see something in Washington, and uh, there was just the general and I and the radio man and the crew chief, and we were going back to Grand Island, Nebraska, which was where we were, and uh, went in to Wright Pat. And right Pat, I think we were just um, fueling. But he said, let's let's go in and, and, and get something at the uh, BX concert. No, snack bar. And uh, then we'll, we'll head right on home. We can get home. 
So we did. We went into the snack bar and into the back and sat down there. And somebody who was in charge of it came down and said, General, sir, you can't sit back here. You've got to sit up at the front table. So we got up and moved to the front table and seated, seated opposite us on another table were about six colonels. And they're having their lunch. And we sat there finishing up our, our food, and, and all of a sudden General Armstrong started to laugh. He said, Dee Dee, I would give you a dime for your reputation right now. <laughs> and they were, they were buzzing. <laughs> so we went on, and uh, then the boss were to be disbanded, and when that, when that came down, when the notice came down that they were going to cancel out in December, I went in and talked to General Armstrong and I said, I'm in this for the duration. This is a wonderful opportunity. I enjoy this. But I have a perfectly good husband that I'd kind of like to get on with my married life. He said, I think you're wise. He said, go ahead, resign. And he said, just pick me out one of the new wasps. And I did, and Mary Helen loved it. She said, this is great. I'll be so happy. The also interesting was Dora, Dora Doherty, was right after that, right after I left, she left. She went out to Wendover with Colonel Tibbetts and stayed there while they did all of their various tests on what altitude the bomb could be dropped, this kind of thing. And she was there, and uh, Mary Helen went with her. Of course, they had no ideas. None of us, none of us had any idea what was going to happen. Uh, for one thing, it was a well-kept secret. But in later years, she was reading how, how this was all determined, and she said, that's what we were doing. We were in this, uh, I think they were flying the C-47, and they'd go in and, and the cockpit door was shut. And then they were told, go to 2,000 feet, now make a turn, do this, all these things while they had the man who was in charge of detonating the bomb was working back there. So she had a very interesting time there until they left. And I went home. I went, no, I didn't go home. I went to North Carolina where my husband was stationed and took up. We lived together happily for 51 years and had five kids and a wonderful life. And thank you all very much. What was your total time when you started flying the 29? My total time when I started flying the 29? Right. Oh. The training uh, for that. Oh. Uh, I think I had about a thousand hours when I got out, but that was sometimes. I'd say probably maybe five, six hundred. Don't hold me to that. Okay. I don't. Dora is writing a book <laughs> on her WASP experience. And uh, one time Hank and I stopped there and she said, I, I need you to check me on all of this B-29 stuff. She said, I have it written. And she said, let's get it straight. So when she gets her book printed, you can find out how much time <laughs> we had. <laughs> Not a whole lot. Question. How did you originally get interested in flying? Well, I, okay. I lived in North Platte, and uh, the Clinch Flying Service was having a CPT group start. And the young woman with whom I, four of us owned a car that didn't always run, and uh, she called one day and she said, Dee Dee, they're taking applications for this CBT class. It will start shortly. And they will let one woman in. And she said, they're, they're getting that started. So I went out and applied, and I got to be the one woman in this CBT class, and that's how I got my license. After... After I got that, uh, John Clinch said, Dee Dee, you know, I'd really like to have you come to work for me. I can't pay you what they do at Nolan Finance, but he said, 
I'll give you flight time. I said, you're on. I went in and told, talked to my bosses, and they were wonderful. They said, do it. I, I think you really ought to do that. Go ahead. So I left there, and I went out. And John had a new contract. This time, they called it War Training Service. And we had Navy cadets. And it was fascinating. I did all of the secretarial work and, and this kind of thing. And uh, he, John Clinch was a fine, fine pilot. And, and I appreciated what he taught me. Three. Dean is uh, the oldest, and, and uh, both he and our son Marshall went to the Air Force Academy. And then they went to flight training in Georgia. And it was our great pleasure to go up there and see them get their wings. And we loved it. And uh, then our daughter, Robin, decided, well, if Mother can do this, I can do it. So she went out and, and got and learned privately to fly. And uh, she's, she's a very good pilot. She's getting up close now to 500 hours. And I said, well, you know, you're supposed to. When you're 500 hours, you're supposed to begin to know what you're doing. And she laughed and said yes. But uh, she comes down to the Keys and will take me back up sometimes when I'm meeting another aircraft. And it's a real joy to sit there and watch your daughter fly. She said, don't you want to, don't you want to take hold? I said, Robin, I'm not going to go back and play around and doing something I once did very well. I don't intend to. I'm watching you, and that's my joy. But it, and then uh, you were right in telling the story about sitting in the C-5. Now that is a real thrill. When your son, he made several, two trips or three, I forget. But I was on the first one, and then my husband was on the second one. And it was just unbelievable to be, number one, to be in this big aircraft. And that C-5, I, I told Marshall, I said, in the old days we had a saying, it'll never get off the ground. <laughs> and I didn't think it would, but he got it off the ground. And his crew was uh, very wonderful, and they kept kidding him. You know, your mother's watching you. Your mother's watching you. She could do it. <laughs> it. It was a real thrill to watch that. So seeing my children, our children, fly, was wonderful. Robin was coming down to the Keys. She lives in Fort Pierce. And she was starting out with her son Patrick, who hates to fly, doesn't come unless he has to. And uh, he wants her to drive her truck. Go to the Keys, drive your truck. So she started out flying because it was a weekend where other of others of our family were going to be home and it was going to be a big get together. And she got started, and I don't remember how far it was, north of Miami, she ran into some really nasty weather. And she watched it a little bit, and then she turned around and went home, called us. And we are both listening to her, and Hank said, Robin, you're a pilot. You had enough brains to do the 180. It's probably the most important maneuver you'll ever learn. Know when you can't handle things. So anyway, watching our children, and we have two other children whom we adore. We live on the same island with us. And they're great even if they don't care too much for aviation. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, PQ-8? Yes. Yes, that was the Culver Cadet. It wouldn't have been healthy because the PQ-8 pilot next would be beeping. And, and, and believe me, we have good memories. It wouldn't have been healthy. No, you, you gave each other all the cooperation. It was really, that was a challenging job um, because it was, it was very basic, you know. Yes, without the wasp. They let us off, and we, we would go back when they had a regular mission. 
we flew many times for the 90 millimeters. And uh, uh, two of those in our team, Rena and Elsie were out one day and they had this PQ-8. And they're flying for the 90 millimeters and they're flying off. They turn, turn this, this uh, PQ-8 on course and they turned around came back and turned it. All of a sudden, the PQ, yeah, they are, not us, but them. The uh, PQ-8 turned and went out to the Atlantic. And they called in and they said, we're very sorry, but our target has gone away and we will go back and get another one and be back within a certain period of time. And the ground, the man on the ground in charge of shooting said, oh, we still are tracking you. They were tracking, they were tracking the UC-78 that was doing the beeping. No, they, they had these, this kind of thing happen every now and then. No one ever, ever really shot down a wasp in a, in a uh, target. But there were close ones. Thank you so much.